Welcome everybody to the Climate Center's webinar series, Envisioning a Climate Safe California, Stories and Solutions. This is the first of our new webinar series. And this time we really want to lean into some of the personal stories uh, that are driving climate action, accelerated equitable climate action here in California. My name is Duran. I will be the MC for you all here today. Uh, and I don't have terribly much to say, but I do have just a couple of important issues that uh, that I would like to cover. Uh, so let me begin by doing a quick screen share uh, so that I can uh, show you a little bit of what I wanna tell you about. Uh, so again, this is the first in our newest webinar series, Envisioning a Climate Safe California Stories and Solution. Today's topic is the real impacts of the climate crisis, stories from the front lines. Uh, and I just wanna point out that this is the first in a series of webinars that will be happening roughly monthly our next one will be on December 8th, building a resilient and equitable grid for the future. Very important subject. And we'll be following that by webinars on heavy duty fleets, building electrification, a world beyond fossil fuels and what that means for workers and communities, sequestering carbon on land and sea and much, much more. I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsors of our webinar. Uh, we couldn't do this without the support of these important organizations and others. So I'd like to thank Sunrun, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Peninsula Clean Energy, MCE, and Enphase. Thank you all. And also to our webinar promotional partners, Climate Resolve, the Community Ener Environmental Council, Civic Well, Actera, Grid Alternatives, all of whom helped get the word out and are a big part of the reason why you are all here with us today. So thank you to all of those. And if your organization would like to become a promotional partner, please just drop us a note. You can put it in the chat or in the Q&A, and we would be happy to share our promotional materials with you so that you can invite your people to come here and be part of our future webinars. We have seven more planned all the way up till next summer. Uh, so once again, I wanna thank everybody for being here. Just a couple of quick items of housekeeping before I turn it over to our first speaker from our team. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A with all of our speakers uh, right around 11 o'clock. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask, uh, please drop them in the Q&A portal at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there's also a chat feature, which you can use to uh, have conversation among yourselves. Or if you want to ping any of our speakers, you can do that through the chat. But we will be corralling all those questions and doing a Q&A together with all of our speakers at 11 o'clock. So keep those questions coming, folks. We really care about what you care about. We wanna make sure we cover the issues that you wanna talk about. So the Q&A is a really important way for you to do that. Uh, so before we turn to our first guest, uh, I'd like to invite my colleague, Woody Hastings, uh, to just do a little context setting. Why are we here today? Why is this all so important? Woody, what can you tell folks about that? Great, thanks, Jerron. Let me just get my screen shared here. Uh, oops. All right. Okay, should see my screen popping up there. Okay, thanks, Jerron, and good morning, all. My name is Woody Hastings, and I am the fossil fuel phase out manager with the Climate Center. I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Climate Center's flagship Climate Safe California program in the context of today's webinar on impacts of fossil fuels. Climate Safe California is a set of policies that will allow California to remove more climate pollution from the atmosphere than we emit by 2030, while creating thousands of jobs and building a more equitable clean energy economy. We believe in thriving, healthy communities and envision a future where everyone in California benefits from equitable access to true climate solutions, clean air, renewable energy, healthful food, and more. Our work is guided by three core principles, adhering to the latest climate science, pri prioritizing climate justice, and securing a just transition for workers, their families, and communities. Our policy platform is built on four pillars, phasing out fossil fuels, scaling up natural carbon removal, investing in resilient community clean energy systems, and unlocking public and private funding for climate action. In this webinar, we focus just on the first one, phasing out fossil fuels. 
For more on the other parts uh, of Climate Safe California, visit our website. Rob is, is going to be dropping the link to Climate Safe California into the chat. Thanks, Rob. Um, okay, so oil and gas interests are standing in the way of progress on on human health and the environment. The Western States Petroleum Association spent more than $17.5 million lobbying California officials over the past three years. In the first half of 2020, oil and gas interests spent four times as much as environmental advocacy groups on lobbying in California. Approximately 2.7 million Californians live within 3,200 feet of active oil and gas wells. These communities are exposed to toxic pollution that causes asthma, respiratory diseases, high risk pregnancies and increased risk of cancer. At the release of the 2022 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres described the situation as code red for humanity. He called out climate polluters and described the latest report as an atlas of human suffering. People living near extraction have been impacted for a long time. Now the consequences of the climate crisis are hitting harder and faster than scientists predicted. And California is ground zero, once again, disproportionately impacting those most vulnerable and least responsible. Climate change poses a huge public health risk, especially for frontline communities. It's been tied to pregnancy risks, affecting black mothers the most, the most. A study of 32 million US births found that women exposed to high temperatures and or air pollution are more likely to have premature, underweight or stillborn babies. We need to invest in clean energy economy jobs. In 2018, there were 2.4 million jobs in clean energy and energy efficiency and half that many in fossil energy. The most rapid clean energy job growth has come from the solar and wind sectors, which rose by 24.5% and 16% respectively from 2016 to 2017. Accelerating a fossil fuel phase out is not just the right thing to do to protect frontline communities. It would also save us money. It's estimated that it could cost as much as $5 billion to plug all the orphaned, abandoned and, abandoned and idle wells in California. And we need to stop adding to this cost by ceasing new permits. On the demand side, California's transportation sector is the number one source of the state's greenhouse gas emissions accounting for roughly half of the state's emissions. Our gas powered vehicles are also bad for our health. A recent study found that breathing fossil fuel polluted air shortens people's lives by an average of three years. So these initiatives that I mentioned early, earlier fit together like pieces of a puzzle. We need to pursue all of them to deliver on the promise of a climate safe future. If we can do this in California, now the fourth largest economy in the world and a major oil and gas producing state, we can do it anywhere. So this is your opportunity to endorse Climate Safe California. Rob will drop the link to the endorsement, pa endorsement page into the chat. Uh, it's endorsed by hundreds of businesses, elected officials, nonprofits, and more than 1600 individuals. And we would love to, to be able to add your name. Uh, here's my contact info. Be happy to follow up with anyone on any of the stuff that I presented. And thank you, Duran. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Woody. Um, and I just want to let folks know if the chat does not seem to be working, we're working to fix that. But we do encourage you all to put your questions in the Q&A. That should be working just fine. And meanwhile, we're working to fix the chat. So thank you all for that. And uh, now I'm very happy to turn to our first speaker, Marisol Cantu, who's an organizer with the Richmond Listening Project. Marisol, there's a lot more I could say about you and all the amazing things you do. You're a teacher, organizer, activist, third generation uh, resident of your community, uh, and your roots go back much farther than that. But I will ask our team to drop a link to your full bio in the chat, and I encourage everyone to learn about our speakers. I want to give you as much time as possible. So Marisol, uh, please tell us uh, what you are uh, uh, doing in Richmond. Thank you so much, Doran. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and welcoming me to be with you this morning. I am third generation, and I want to share and just situate 
everybody to my story. And my story um, starts at a really young age, living at um, the right next to the second largest polluter in California, which is the Chevron refinery. And as a young age, I saw my very young brother uh, go in and out of the hospital, breathing treatment, spending his first, first birthday in the hospital due to severe asthma. And I didn't understand exactly what this was caused, what was causing this. I just knew that this was normal, that so many people in my family, my friends carried inhalers on the playground. Um, there, there was something so normalized about chronic respiratory illnesses and yet never spoken around the the largest second largest polluter being in our backyard and so later in life I came to the work as being an activist starting putting those puzzle pieces like what Lee's talking about and connecting my story um to so many else's so many buddy so many other community members and I'm gonna go ahead and start with um a slideshow just to give you a little bit more about my work and so through the Rich and Progressive Alliance, in order to transition away from the fossil fuel industry and the refining industry in particular, the Rich and Progressive Alliance undertook a listening project to listen to the stories of frontline community members. And if folks uh, don't know, Chevron Refinery actually started before our city's charter was created. So just thinking over a hundred years ago, re industry refinery was here and has been our neighbor as, as what they would like to call it. So what we did was we centered, we centered all BIPOC community uh, members and residents in our project. And our process was simple, listen, to understand the stories, to educate, to dispel the myths of being a good neighbor, and then to engage and activate towards hopefully a just transition. And this listening project started with surveys. We use the Calendaro screen to listen, to understand through surveys the impact. And I'll share a couple of results from that, that surveys, those surveys. And then we interviewed. We interviewed our residents, asking them questions, never, never with the jargon of our climate of, of just transition and needing to explain it. We really wanted to make our language accessible. So we asked about what our world would be like if Chevron left. And you're going to hear some of those stories today. And working with young people and being the only millennial that doesn't listen to podcasts, they said, let's create a podcast. <laughs> so we created a 10 episode podcast um, that embeds our community voices directly. And so for our surveys, I just, uh, I won't be reading all of this, but wanted to just give you a glimpse that over 71% of our community understood that the climate crisis affected them in some way, shape, or form. Um, and 71 said a lot. We also directly asked about the Chevron refinery playing a large role in the climate crisis. And again, overwhelmingly, many people said yes. And then we asked a much more personal question, which was what I had seen happen in my life. And again, just staggering results that almost half of our community members suffer from a chronic respiratory illness. They either themselves had a respiratory illness or were directly related to somebody. And we also wanted to dispel this myth that the refinery is the largest employer. And through research, we found that less than 10% of the 
refineries employees actually lived in the frontline community. And we wanted to get at this. We wanted to understand what when we talked to community, they said, no, we can't lose Chevron because they're the largest employer. But nobody was actually asking the question, well, who are they employing? Are they employing us? Are they employing frontline community members? And so we asked this question and 80% um, said they did not know anybody actually working at the refinery. And so this became the podcast. So I would love to just share this with you. Um, and believe my sound is all ready to go. This just in, some flaring at the Chevron refinery in Richmond spotted across the Bay Area. This video from one of our cameras. And that breaking news is in Richmond where this flaring at the Chevron refinery is under investigation. If Richmond wants to take a more proactive approach to look into what's causing all that flaring. At this is what You're it looked like about an hour that spilled ago. into the San Francisco Bay and San Pablo. So people in Solano County may have felt the impact of the smoke, and you can see it. Smell like somebody spill, spill gasoline in front of my house. And unconfirmed reports that it has reached the shoreline. Richmond Refinery experienced flaring activity. Take a look at that pic. Refinery experienced flaring activity. Flaring activity. Flaring activity. Welcome to the Listening Project podcast, sharing stories to amplify voices. When most people hear climate crisis, they think of extreme droughts, polar bears on the verge of extinction, and rapidly melting ice caps. But what about the people? the communities, the families most harmed by some of the biggest polluters right in our backyard. Right here in our small rich city, we live through the climate crisis every day. We don't need to go anywhere. We see, feel, smell, and breathe the climate crisis caused by the Chevron refinery, the second largest polluter in California. We are here. The climate crisis is here. It is us who are fighting every day for our health, for our air, for our water, and for our futures. That is why we're here. This mini podcast series is a collection of stories told by those who are most impacted and harmed by Chevron's stronghold on our city, our community, and our environment. This podcast will take you on a journey through the lives of real Richmond folks, covering topics like education, community health, and the local economy. And we'll highlight special guests such as youth leaders and community advocates. This podcast is sponsored by the Richmond Progressive Alliance. For more information, visit the website below or follow our Instagram. And with that, we also started working with the Othering and Belonging Institute to launch a series of reports. We started educating and making an impact in so many different ways. We stood online with our USW strike workers that was unprecedented unprecedented strike. Um, and they have now had a contract. We worked with our county supervisor, John Joya. We did community outreach in so many different ways and were able to plan an anti-Chevron day right here in Richmond um, with Amazon Watch. And we are actually now moving into educating. And so through UC Berkeley and the Other and Belonging Institute, we are working, uh, we have published a series of reports uh, based on our research, including some of our voices. We've made this educational video. I will drop it in the link due to time. And we are being, we are engaging our community. I am a, a community steering committee community steering committee member through AB 617, um, California's initiatives for the community emissions reduction plan. I am the co-lead for fuel refining storage and distribution. And we are also uh, working on a grant for the community economic, for SURF Community Economic Resilience Fund. And the name of that initiative is Transformation from the Block to the Region. And so really centering our stories moving from the stories and listening portion to educating and now engaging very deeply with our community. And I thank you.
Thank you, Marisol. Uh, it's amazing to hear what you guys are doing in Richmond, and we hope to support you in as many ways as we can, as I'm sure do many of our attendees here today. So thank you for sharing your story. And uh, Marisol will be sticking around uh, for our uh, Q&A that'll be coming up. So please do drop any questions you have for her in the Q&A portal and really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to move now to our next speaker, Cesar Aguirre. Uh, a community organizer in Kern County uh, with the California Environmental Justice Network. Uh, Cesar, you also have stories to tell, and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, what it is you'd like to share with our audience here today. So I turn the mic over to you. Of course, thank you so much. And I think one thing that I, I wanna focus on and, and make sure to touch base on is, is that community members are the experts in their own experience. And a lot of times when we speak with regulators, they like to dismiss communities' firsthand experiences and effects with polluters, with dealing with um, chronic exposure, and making sure that we open the eyes of regulators to this is important. So being a, a resident of Kern County, uh, you know, the oil country of California, uh, I've definitely dealt with my fair share of leaks and dealing with regulators dealing with leaks. Um, never in the history of leaks have I seen a leak be responded to like the leak that happened in this neighborhood. Uh, this is the Morningstar neighborhood, a two year old development uh, that was built atop of an active oil field uh, in the, Ker the Kern Bluff oil field. This is from a map called Wellfinder that's available to the public from CalGEM, our state regulators here in California. And each of these little gray dots here is a well. You'll notice that some of these houses were built atop of a well. Um, and you'll also notice that a lot of these uh, wells are uh, near the perimeter of this uh, very, very new development. Two of the wells that were found leaking in this neighborhood uh, reached national attention. Uh, and because so, in my opinion, uh, actual um, tangible actions were taken to protect and preserve uh, public health. Uh, for the first time ever in California history, uh, CalGEM uh, held two community meetings to let people know the dangers and the, the possible symptoms of dealing with a leak, which there was, uh, I think, a, over a dozen wells that were found in the surrounding area to be leaking. Uh, and uh, the California Air Resources Board went door to door knocking on every door in this neighborhood asking about health effects where they found, you know, I think over half the people that answered their doors shared that they had, you know, some symptom related to uh, chronic exposure of these leaks, right? Uh, and the reason that I say chronic is because the first two wells that were found in this neighborhood were found to be wells that were owned by a company that has been bankrupt for over 11 years. So that means very possibly for the last 11 years, this well has fell under very poor maintenance and allowed uh, a leak that was found to be at explosive levels. And this is something that uh, is echoed in the history of Kern County. This is what Kern County looks like and Bakersfield looks like when we zoom out. Remember each of these little dots as well, um, the different colors show you the different kinds of wells that it is, but we are littered and surrounded by wells on all sides here in Kern County. And were setbacks uh, respected uh, when health problems were discovered, then a lot of lives would be saved and a lot of money would have stayed within the hands of the family economy in places like Kern County and Los Angeles had we not uh, used that for asthma and for doctor visits to deal with the pollution that comes from these sites. Uh, and the reason I'm confident in saying that the pollution comes from these sites is because we have done community science, we've done air sampling, we've done um, uh, air monitoring around the neighborhoods that are most affected by this. And many times the neighborhoods that are most affected are rural neighborhoods. So uh, talking about some air samples that we took, this is uh, the following results that I'm gonna be talking about in the following slides are gonna be from one air sample that we took in Arvin. Uh, this site caused a leak that evacuated eight families for nine months. And the sample that we took was actually taken three years after that leak was found. And we got an open violation on this same site last year. Uh, so since 2014, the site has been a problem. And in the sample that we took, we found methane at 
21,900 micrograms per cubic meter, right? Uh, which is far above the 1,200 uh, limit that, that is set um, for ambient air. So this shows that something is leaking and it's leaking at a level that is not safe for people um, that took this bucket sample at their house uh, near this site, right? Um, and methane is important because it causes a lot of climate change. It is a greenhouse gas and it is very, very good at retaining heat and keeping that heat here in our atmosphere. Talking about public health, what we found in that air sample was a level of benzene that represented an unacceptable lifetime risk. Um, and the level of benzene that we found was five times, I'm sorry for the sound, uh, was five times above the legal limit. Uh, give me just one second. I'm sorry about that. Uh, was five times above the legal limit. One second. Thank you, Cesar. We'll we'll uh, we'll wait for you. These are some of the uh, challenges of our current uh, work from home, remote everything. Here, he's back. All right, welcome back, Cesar. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Um, but the levels um, were not safe for public health. They produced lifetime cancer risk uh, in the samples that we showed, and also uh, a problem for public safety. The wells that leaked in Morningstar were found at explosive levels. This sample showed an explosive level at a well that was supposed to be dealt with three years before we took the sample. Um, and this is an interview from a uh, article that came out earlier this year where we interviewed a family that has a well basically in their backyard. And talking to them, we let them know the symptoms of what being chronically exposed to these um, polluters is, right? Nosebleeds, headaches, fatigues, dizziness. Um, and Yesenia Martinez, who is the person that lives close to this well, uh, when asked, do any of these sound familiar, you know, said every day. So we've taken uh, both the uh, anecdotal stories of um, the public and we've amplified it with evidence that is at the level of EPA, right? So um, if regular, regulators won't accept it, then we'll just give it to their boss because um, we're, we're tired of not being listened to, we're tired of being dismissed, and community science gives community leaders the tools to be able to show that, hey, my experience is real and you have to respect it because if you won't listen to me, then you have to listen to the science. And unfortunately, that's a step that we have to take in order to feel heard. Um, and this is not something that is an accident, right? This is a small clipping from a Sorrell report. This was paid for by Waste Management in 1984. Uh, and this was a study to be done around Kettleman City, right? Where to put a polluter. And we can see just based off these two lists, what kinds of neighborhoods they focus on, right? Uh, rural communities, uh, low-income communities, uh, communities that are not involved in, in social issues. And when we look at uh, where they target, they target places like Arvin, they target places like Lamont. So I think it's important to note that, you know, when we look at who is uh, exposed to the most to these things, it's no accident that the numbers are overwhelmingly uh, affecting low-income rural communities. So frontline stories are important, frontline stories are real. And the fact that we have been ignored for so long and have been driven to uh, produce uh, evidence at the level above regulators that the EPA will accept uh, shows the level of respect that we receive um, at a regulatory level as community members. So making sure that we have this evidence is important to show decision makers, to show regulators, and to show enforcers that none of them are doing their job and we have the evidence to show that. So making sure that your story is heard is making sure that your story is heard is very important and linking up to, um, you know, finding ways on, on how to show that, even if it's just, you know, sitting down at, at, in your porch and counting how many diesel trucks drive by and showing that, you know, 100 diesel trucks drive by an hour, um, that shows that your story is real and that's a way to collect evidence to um, show what polluters are affecting your community and in what way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for uh, covering so much important information in such a short amount of time. Um, I see that uh, the senator is with us, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you 
to our webinar, Senator Limon. Uh, just a couple of quick words of introduction. I'll turn over the microphone to you. For those of you who don't know, and you should, uh, Senator Limon represents the 19th district, which is down in Central California of Santa Barbara Ventura counties. Um, and uh, she's the lead author of the historic oil and gas setbacks bill, SB 1137, which is a, a huge victory. So congratulations on that. And rather than continue to take your time with more laudatory words of which I could say many, uh, I will just turn it to you, Senator Limon, and tell us what are you, what's your story? What do you think? And what do you think we should be doing about this? So thank you all. Thank you, uh, Doran, for allowing me to, to kind of just share a few words um, about this. And so I think it's, uh, I am, you know, the Senator representing the Central Coast. I represent Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. And so for me, it's important to share that with all uh, of you listening and participating today, because I think sometimes we create uh, images of what communities look like. And uh, sometimes those images uh, uh, make some parts of our community invisible. And in my community, I, uh, we have had oil extraction since 1866. Uh, so we have had oil extraction for over 150 years. And my community knows very well um, what it's like to have a reliance on an industry um, where things can go wrong. And when things go wrong, they impact uh, the environment, they impact air, water, uh, quality, uh, but they impact also all living uh, things as well, including the people who, who work in those communities who work in that sector, um, but all the way around. In 1969, uh, the Santa Barbara coast had the big oil spill. And that oil spill, uh, many credit for the modern environmental movement. And so for a lot of us, uh, we reflect back to that moment, at least, you know, whether we, we were there or whether we read about it in history, and we reflect back to the moment and know that it started a larger conversation. And sometimes that that larger conversation wasn't always inclusive of all voices, uh, right? Um, but it was a, a conversation that nonetheless was very meaningful to starting to think about what environmental protections came, um, you know, from a really horrible spill. We have both offshore oil and uh, oil extraction on land. So we see it from uh, multiple directions and multiple uh, ways of extracting. And certainly we've had issues, big issues with both. And so as someone who was born and raised in this community, I am the daughter of immigrants, the first in my family to go to college. I come from a working class background. Um, I certainly know what it means to have the need to have a job um, that puts food on the table, uh, but also uh, to understand that meant that very often communities like myself um, that are not always thought about as, as being part of Santa Barbara and Ventura counties uh, are the ones that are most impacted. I think of my community and the community that I represent for the example of Oxnard. And I think about how Oxnard um, on the beach, which is a predominantly Latino community, we have a very big Latino population. We have a power plant. Um, we would not have put that power plant there had the community looked different, right? Had it been a different community. So for me, it's been uh, really an honor to, to be in this role as a legislator for the last six years, but it's also been really important for someone like me to be a voice uh, for an area uh, that has had a long, long trajectory on uh, environmental uh, work. And I bring a lens with me around what environmental justice looks like and ask different types of questions that are, I, I think, uh, you know, more inclusive of thinking of the overall impacts. Uh, one of the things that I have been um, very proud to do, and as was mentioned, uh, and it was led by Senator Lena Gonzalez from Long Beach, um, and uh, it was the setbacks bill, a bill that we had attempted. I had been a co-author of this bill multiple times um, to try to, uh, you know, put a separation between the new wells that are coming into place um, with some of our, you know, sensitive sites, including schools, hospitals, daycares, um, places where we know that, that are closer uh, to, to folks. And so uh, this has been um, a very big challenge. Uh, and I say that because there are times where the some of us work as a team and we're able to get the work across the finish line, 
but we don't do it by ourselves. And so often it comes on the back of years of attempts. I think about Senator Holly Mitchell, who is now in LA County, who did work in this space. Senator Scott Weiner, who ran a bill in this space. Assemblymember uh, Al Marisucci, who ran a bill in this space. Uh, and, and really it took years and many attempts uh, to be able to get it across the finish line. Um, regrettably, as soon as it was across the finish line and signed within 24 hours of a business day, we had uh, the initiation of a referendum that was filed uh, to undo the law that California passed that the governor signed. Uh, we are watching and monitoring that very fast, but also know that our fight was not just years of work to try to get legislation that prioritizes the health of our community, including uh, our communities of color who are often the closest to some of these sites and extraction sites and oil wells, um, but it's uh, an effort that is going to be ongoing. We expect that this is going to be a long fight um, and that it will be a costly fight um, to be able to keep our law in place um, and, 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 and to do that um, you know, with the industry that has an incredible amount of financial resources um, and really influence uh, in the state legislature. That was not an easy bill to get across the finish line. Additionally, you know, when I got to the legislature, the legislature, people were like, are you sure you want to work on oil bills are very difficult. There are very few individuals in the legislature who will take on uh, these, this space. And I said, look, I was elected um, as a representative of my district. So not working on some of our bigger problems for our district, I think would be a disservice uh, for the district. Uh, I have taken on different oil bills every single year. Their magnitude really changes. All of them are difficult. I know sometimes we uh, look at them and we're like, well, that doesn't do a lot. But I have to tell you that getting anything that takes on a very, um, you know, resource uh, heavy industry is is absolute it's just really difficult but in addition to working on setbacks with senator lena gonzalez i've been able to do a lot of work on abandoned and and idle wells uh i, I think now it, it, i find it fascinating that anytime that there is an article on abandoned and idle wells i get um uh legislators uh with very different perspectives who will send me the article because they know i've been working on this uh for a lot and it's not always uh the most you know, the, again, the biggest legislation, but it's really meaningful. Um, and for me, it was a fundamental problem of seeing that our state uh, and our communities have these oil wells that are abandoned. Um, some of them are abandoned uh, because the companies have gone out of business, uh, they went bankrupt, and now it is up to taxpayers uh, to figure out what to do with them when they're in our community. Some of them are just idle. They haven't been used in 10, 15, 25 years um, and are sitting there. And when they're not abandoned properly, uh, they leak pollutants into the air. And again, those pollutants are so often closest to communities. Um, who are underrepresented um, and who honestly look like me. Uh, and so I think of ways of, of that we can address this issue that is across our state um, and it is an issue that's impacting so many individuals. So uh, I believe that we shouldn't leave taxpayers uh, with the, to bear the brunt of cleaning up um, those messes. Uh, and so we've done some work around uh, ensuring that we have more funding, uh, that we have more industry buy-in uh, to be able to cap, uh, properly cap some of these abandoned and idle wells across our state. Uh, and so I'm very proud of that work. Uh, additionally, this year, uh, we talked a whole lot about carbon capture. And I know folks on here have very different and mixed feelings. Um, and I think that as a legislator, you also look at the momentum you know, of where policies are going. Um, so I ran SB 1314, which is a bill uh, that prohibits enhanced oil uh, extraction. Uh, so no EOR uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, using carbon capture. This is very big. Um, it had a lot of opposition. And uh, again, all of this stuff has opposition, as, as you all know. Uh, but uh, you know, it also was big because over 80% of carbon capture projects in our world globally use enhanced oil recovery. Um, and so this is something that is used to extract more oil. And for me, it came down to why would we look at using a tool like carbon capture to reduce carbon from the air, but then 
extract more fossil fuels. Um, I really felt that it was important to, to make sure that if this was um, a project that was going to be uh, happening in our state, and of course it was happening because there were already federal um, allowances for that to happen and approvals, um, that we made sure that our state said no to enhanced oil recovery. So these are some of the bills that I've run all of them have come from issues that we see in our communities, um, from issues that many of you have raised, uh, whether it's happening in my district or in Kern County or in uh, Los Angeles County. I mean, you name it, wherever it is happening, these are issues that impact a lot of us who have uh, the oil industry um, in, our, in our district and who, who are doing work there. So I am grateful that we've been able to work in partnership. None of what we do, we do alone. We do it in community and in partnership. And I think that that is how we're able to get some of this across the finish line. I know that there are times where we would love to be able to have a big work done, um, overnight success, uh, but so often it, it really, it, it builds on years and years of getting little slices that add up to more meaningful work. Uh, so that is just a little bit about myself, the work that I do, um, but also the work that's so uh, that's really influenced um, by the community and the people that I represent um, in this community, uh, but also across the state. Um, we are not alone. And I think that uh, sometimes, you know, there's things that that we perceive divide us, but we really do share a commonality in understanding some of the impacts um, that having a sector that impacts the environment um, has for our community. So grateful to be here with you to share a little bit about uh, what I do, what motivates me, and why I do the work that I do. Thank you so much, Senator, and uh, we really appreciate you being here and sharing your personal story as well as your policy vision. Um, if you can stick around for about 10 minutes, we're gonna to turn to questions and, and we'd love you to be part of that. We have a bunch of questions for you as well as the other panelists. But before we turn to that, I wanna just say two things before I introduce our next speaker. One, keep those questions coming. We hope to have a robust discussion. Drop those in the Q&A portal. Uh, secondly, uh, for those of you who have not yet done so, uh, we still encourage you to endorse Climate Safe California, our groundbreaking policy platform that addresses a lot of these issues of important transition for workers and phasing out fossil fuels. But to continue that conversation, I'd like to invite Kobe Nasik to join our uh, conversation. Kobe is a uh, coalition coordinator for Vision Cal uh, California. Vision is Voices in Solidarity Against Oil in Neighborhoods. So very topical, right on the nose. Kobe, what can you tell us about the work you're doing and the stories from your community? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Let me get my um, presentation up here. Um, thanks so much um, for everyone who spoke before me. I feel like I've got a tough act to follow all these amazing speakers, especially Senator Lee Moon. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Kobe. Um, he, him pronouns. I'm calling from unceded Ohlone land in the East Bay. Um, and right now I serve as the coalition coordinator for Vision. Vision is the environmental justice um, coalition that was behind SB 1137, which um, you've heard a couple of other speakers mention that um, Senator Limon co-authored and helped get across the finish line. Um, and it's the setbacks bill. Um, so that's what I'm talk a little bit more about. Um, Vision, like I mentioned, is the coalition of environmental justice, health and safety and frontline organizations based mostly in Kern County and in LA County um, working on the singular goal of ending neighborhood oil and gas drilling. Um, it might seem uh, surprising to some of y'all that it's still legal to drill for oil and gas near our homes, near our schools um, in California, but the reality is that it's still one of the states without um, a setbacks provision. Um, and setbacks is um, the method that Vision, um, I guess, is working toward to end neighborhood drilling. And what that means is a set distance between where oil and gas extraction happens and the places that we hold close, our homes, our schools, um, our hospitals and healthcare um, sites. Um, and so that's what we're working toward. And the bill that made that happen was SB 1137. So first I'm gonna talk about why setbacks are important. Um, and there's a couple reasons. Um, first, we know that setbacks is a racial justice issue. 
and I know this might be familiar to some of y'all um, and also might be new to others. Um, and so if you're a, a diehard supporter of setbacks, um, let us know in the chat and thanks for, for listening to this, maybe not the first time. Um, yeah, so setbacks is a racial justice issue. Um, more and more we're seeing studies um, that actually take place in California and look at California populations come out um, that reveal things like there is a higher incidence of redlining, um, which is restricting um, where people live based off of their race um, or other ethnic backgrounds um, with the occurrence of oil and gas drilling in neighborhoods. And essentially what this means is that neighborhood drilling is not something that impacts everyone equally. We know more and more that it impacts low-income communities and impacts non-white communities and Spanish-speaking communities in California more. Um, it's also a reproductive justice issue. Um, there's recent studies that tell us that one of the main uh, negative impacts of oil and gas in our backyards is harmful effects on pregnant people and their families. There's a higher risk for um, complicated pregnancies or low birth weight babies um, that come when you live and are pregnant near oil and gas extraction. Um, and lastly, um, it's an environmental justice issue. And, and I think it, this is one of the biggest environmental justice fights um, in California over the past couple of years that really exemplifies what environmental justice is. And um, you know, we could spend an entire hour talking about that concept, but loosely, um, it's the idea that no one, regardless of their zip code, of their um, background or identity has to suffer any worse consequences um, in their environment um, from their health or big oil pollution than anyone else. Um, and so that's really what we're fighting for and why setbacks, that minimum distance between oil and gas extraction in our homes and our schools is the solution. Um, and what we're doing is we're not telling oil and gas, um, <clears throat> you can't drill anymore. It's just saying you can't do this near our communities when we know it's poisonous and we know it's toxic. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit now about the legislative path to achieving setbacks. Um, and really, uh, it seems like we all kind of prepared a similar presentation because all the speakers so far have talked about centering the voices of the communities most affected um, and that being the pathway to success and the pathway um, for us to not only be able to tell our stories on a bigger platform, but win. And that's exactly what we did with the issue of setbacks. Um, I think it was almost three years ago now, the first push in the legislation to achieve setbacks happened, and it came from Vision. It came from this coalition of community-based organizations and neighborhood-based organizations that said, we're not going back. This is the solution that the community has identified. And this is what we're going to move forward with. It's not going to be something top down. It's going to come from us and we're going to tell our stories. Um, and we started with um, one bill, AB 345. Some of y'all may remember. Um, and that made it through the assembly, but got stuck in the Senate um, and the Natural Resources Committee voted down by some moderates to conservative Democrats. Um, we tried a few years later with SB 467, if y'all remember that one which was more ambitious and it set the setback distance at 2,500 feet, um, so about half a mile. Um, and again, it was voted down by about the same set of um, Democrats in the California Senate. Um, and then this past year, just a few, I guess now it's a little, a few months ago, um, we were successful with 1137, the most ambitious setbacks provision of 3,200 feet, um, which is about a kilometer grounded in the science um, of what we know to be where um, we see these negative health impacts of living near oil and gas extraction to be. Um, and it was successful. Um, and I think I'm going to take a little bit now to talk about, oh wait, no, I'll stay on this slide, to talk about why it was successful. Um, so from the very beginning, we centered environmental justice communities and frontline communities and frontline voices. Um, and we were able to push these um, attempts in the legislation forward because of that. So this wasn't, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of, this wasn't a legislative push where the communities that call for setbacks weren't in the driver's seat, is what I want to say. And we were able to achieve um, 1137 passing 
through um, the Senate, through that tricky committee, um, and all the way to being signed by the governor into law, because we set up this system where environmental justice communities were leading and our wonderful allies um, in the legislature, like Senator Limon, um, outside the legislature, like the Climate Center, um, these more resource organizations that have been around for longer, um, people who have connections with the press and media, they were behind us every step of the way. Um, and they were following the strategy and the conversations that were being led by the communities that were infected themselves. Um, and a couple of examples of this is, you know, when we need to um, run ads really quickly, but um, because of our smaller capacity, we don't have the ability to do that. Some of our allies stepped up and said, hey, this is somewhere we can help because we have you know, the professional team that's dedicated to doing this. Um, when we say we want to run an op-ed and we want to try to land it in a big paper, but we don't have the connections um, to be able to do that. And some of our allies say, you know, we know this paper, we know them well, we've pitched them before, we can help you. Um, that's really how we're able to move everyone forward and achieve this big victory um, for setbacks. Um, sorry, that's my phone. And I'll wrap up just by um, talking a little bit now what happens next. So um, as Senator Limon mentioned, we, oops. Um, as Senator Limo mentioned, we achieved 1137. We had this huge setback victory. Um, but just a few days later, the oil and gas industry filed for a referendum for a ballot measure to undo all of our hard work. Um, right now, they are spending millions of dollars to deceive the public by getting um, signatures for lower gas prices outside of um, grocery stores and in strip malls across the state. You may have seen them. Um, and what they're doing is um, putting the issue of setbacks um, on the ballot in 2024 if they're successful. And that will essentially postpone all of our hard work by two years. Um, and right now, Vision is working hard with state agencies to make sure that we're still able to achieve these protections for our communities. Um, I saw someone post in the chat, we have a town hall tonight with CalGEM, which is the regulatory agency that's tasked with regulating oil and gas in California. Um, later tonight at 5.30, you can join and find out more um, about what it's like to give comment to a public agency um, and to support setbacks there. Um, and we'll also be working hard to fight the ballot measure. Um, we are right now working on voter education so that everyone knows when you see those people um, that are being paid by big oil um, who are trying to get um, signatures to decline to sign. Um, and to tell your friends um, to decline to sign as well. And I think um, I'm happy to send more information in the chat and answer questions. I don't wanna get too into the nitty gritty of the referendum um, because you know I think we're focusing like on the stories and the solutions that work, but I'm excited that moving forward, we've built such a strong, powerful um, allyship and a powerful movement behind the fight for setbacks in California that I already know is having ramifications in other places like Pennsylvania and Colorado and Texas, which are some other um, oil states in the US. Um, and we have this example of when community, um, communities that are impacted get to tell their stories with their own words when they're in the driver's seat. And we have our allies and a strong um, movement behind us, we're able to win. Um, and that's what will be doing the next couple of years. And if we've got to take it to the ballot measure in 2024, um, we'll be ready for that fight and excited for, for everyone's help. And I think I'll pause there. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Kobe, not only for what you uh, shared with us here today, but for all the hard work that you and your colleagues have done. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to move uh, to our interactive portion. Uh, we we want to start taking questions. I'd like to invite all of our speakers uh, to join us back on camera. And I want to start with you, Senator Limon. I know your time may be constrained, so I want to make sure to get, uh, there was a lot of questions here uh, for you. Uh, I want to start with kind of a kind of a big one, kind of a broad one. Um, and, and it's in regard to the phase out of fossil fuels, it's going to require reductions in both demand and in supply. We've been talking a lot about supply, but of course this is a two-headed beast, right? Uh, but the state doesn't seem to have a multi-agency coordinated plan for a managed decline in order to achieve its goals while also protecting the communities who work 
in these areas and making sure that there's meaningful employment for them. Would you agree with this statement? Do you think there's a policy gap in California and how might we address it? I'd like to start with you, Senator. Thank you. So I will say that I do agree that there is a policy gap, but I do believe we are starting to address it. So I'll give you one example. Uh, I talked a lot about uh, abandoned and idle wells. Well, there was a bill, uh, Senate Bill 1295 that I ran this year as well, that started to look about started to look at the labor piece and who we are bringing in to do some of this work. Historically, we've just so everybody knows, we have over 5,000 of these wells um, uh, here in the state of California, and we plug and abandon five to 11 a year. Uh, so on that rate, we, we have uh, hundreds of years worth of work if we go at that rate. But this year, the federal government put some money in um, to different states with this problem. Uh, and we put some money in as well and got more money from industry to be able to tackle this um, in a much more aggressive way than we ever have. But what we are doing is we're also asking, um, and what that's what the bill did, it asked for some of the workers who do this work to transition um, to do this work in plugging and abandoning. We know that if we start plugging and abandoning wells at a higher rate of 11, you know, more than 11 a year, uh, especially when we have 1,000, we are looking to 20 to 50 years worth of this work. Um, historically, some of this work has been, you know, third parties coming in from different states uh, to be able to do this. So I will say that that is one small example of how we are starting to bridge this conversation about who are the workers that are going to be able to do this work? What expertise do they have? How do we ensure that it goes to California workers? I think, and it's been mentioned by other speakers, that not all the time some of this work is done by folks in the community, right, or in our state. Um, how do we ensure that? So uh, it was, you know, again, it was a hard bill, and we didn't always agree. Um, and we still have to do more to be inclusive of all workers who do, do work in this space. But I will say that I think it's an example of how we're starting to close it. You you should expect that we will probably close this, um, you know, gap that we have, this policy gap in terms of a more systematic approach, um, little by little. Um, these are all difficult bills. I will tell you that even for some, you know, for some sectors, some folks uh, to think about uh, plugging and abandoning, um, they see it with a lens of you're getting you're you're getting rid of my jobs. I've had to do so much work in saying these already exist. No one's extracting oil from them. They are sitting there leaking pollutants. Like there's had there's had to be a conversation, a back and forth about what we're really trying to do and why this is potentially some of a lot of other work. Um, the state also made meaningful investments on you know wind. Uh, and, and those, you know, again, we, we can think that perhaps that, you know, the language that was put forward wasn't what we would, I, you know, ideally like to support. But in that win, we're also looking at some of the workers. Um, we feel like if you've been in some of this, you know, some of these spaces, you can transfer some of those skills over. I will tell you that we've gotten um, a lot of pushback on the term just transition. Um, it is not a term um, that I think was embraced by the workers themselves, not a term that they gave to themselves um, or that they bought into. So I, you know, and I want to just acknowledge that, that words matter, how we label things matter and who does the labeling um, and who does that. Uh, so we are working towards a better transition. I don't know what the right term is at this moment, but I will tell you that I want to just recognize and call that out um, as something that, again, when we're having this conversation, it doesn't matter what direction we're having it, it's important to have people at the table, including workers. Thank you so much for those thoughts. And, and we have so many other questions. We have questions on methane. We have questions on a lot of important subjects, and I want to get to those but I'd like to start with, an, I'd like to bring in another question that, Senator, I'd like perhaps you to address, and I'd also like the other members of the panel to also address this in their own way. So we'll do a little popcorn round where we go to you, and then we go around to the other speakers. Uh, and I'm sort of bundling a bunch of questions together here, but several people are asking something along the lines of, what was different? How, why did this bill, this setbacks bill pass? Why were we able to achieve this victory what are some of the obstacles moving forward and how can we organize to achieve more victories? So like perhaps drawing lessons from this particular bill, I'll start with you, Senator. Like why did this bill pass when it had not passed before? 
I mean, well, my first answer is because you had two women of color running it. Um, but, I mean, but really, it's not just that, you know, it's just like my little moment to be like, yeah, look, all of a sudden you have people who are running this bill who have a different relationship with some of the impacts, right, that are happening in our community. But no, realistically, it's because of all of you. Um, you know, it is because there's been a coalition because that coalition didn't give up three years ago, four years ago. Um, none of this happens by ourselves. This was an incredible coalition. This was years of work. And that needs to be called out too, that the losses that we had over the last five or 10 years in this space um, are actually part of the success today. They cannot be forgotten. They should not be erased because they absolutely gave us the ability to change how we talk about things, to do the work that we're doing. Um, but I, you know, and I think that this was, it, it took, we had a difficult year last year and prior years in terms of getting some big things done in this space. And I, I almost feel like this year, it was a reflection of like, look, we've had really big losses. Um, how do we get this out? And you had, I, you know, I want to be grateful to the coalition, but also to leadership in all three sectors, right? The assembly, the Senate, and uh, the governor's office. Um, you had leadership that uh, was part of this equation. Um, this equation got bigger. Um, and I think that, you know, you look at every single piece and no one did it by ourselves. Um, it was, it really was years of effort. So, you know, my first comment was more than silly than anything, but it really was about, look, it, it was, it was a big team effort and it took us as a team years to get it through this finish line, learning from lessons, you know, and, and really failure of the past um, and being able to get all of the right uh, players at the table. Um, it was hard. And I would say that we're not done. I mean, this referendum is also reality that uh, we may be having more conversations about this exact same bill and issue um, in really significant ways. So, um, you know, let's not completely, uh, you know, let's celebrate for the accomplishments of today, but understand that we definitely have um, a fight for tomorrow. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And before I turn to the other speakers in the order in which you presented, I just wanted to point out that, that what you said at the beginning, you said perhaps in jest, but it, it's not, it's actually relevant, right? Like we talk about centering the, the Kobe, you were talking about centering and a couple people asked about that. So Marisol, perhaps with you, like in terms of leadership and, and what we need to do moving forward in terms of phasing out fossil fuels, in terms of addressing the climate crisis, uh, how can we achieve more victories? What are your thought about thoughts about that? And then I'll turn to Cesar and Kobe in that order. Go ahead, Marisol. And I also, as a woman of color, want to thank and uplift Senator because I rarely see senators and people like me. So it does make a big difference. It makes a big difference when I'm in the community and my neighbors know that it's me, when the workers know that it's a third generation Latina that is here, that is speaking for, with them, beside them. And so I think that's the triangulation that the senator is talking about bringing the workers to the table, bringing the community to the table, and bringing government agencies to the table. Right here in Richmond, we have a small but mighty fight of our AB 617, our Community Emissions Reduction Plan, and we have our government agency, BACMED, that many of our communities don't trust, and that has seen our government agencies as a failure. We've also had a narrative, a counter narrative of workers against community. And so how do we bridge those gaps so that we can move really, really strong policies forward, celebrating the wins, but then also recognizing um, the, the different mistakes and learning from the past to move campaigns forward. So I think it's a coalition effort. And I think that coalition is always centering the most harmed and in Richmond, that's black and brown community members. Thank you, Marisol. Uh, very, very helpful. Cesar, I'd like to turn to you and I'd like to throw in one more twist as you think about addressing this question. Uh, what specific challenges to organizing uh, are unique to your community in the Central Valley? Uh, is it different there? Is it the same? Like, wh what can you share with us about what we need to be thinking about uh, in terms of assisting your community in addressing these challenges moving forward? Yeah, um, 
I think that's an important uh, part of this. Uh, like uh, Senator Limon mentioned, the framing and the words are very important, right? Uh, when I say just transition in Kern County, people will close their ears. But when I say diversify our economy, then they become interested, right? Because uh, oil and gas is a big part of our tax base and we are number one in oil and gas, but we're also number one in renewable energy. And if we learn how to profit off of that and we have all of the skilled workers to be able to, to take that step forward, then we can show that we're willing to not be a sacrifice zone, right? A lot of the carbon capture that's gonna be pumped underground is coming to Kern County, it's coming to Central Valley. Um, how can we show Kern County residents and the skilled workers that have lived here for generations that we are not a sacrifice zone and we are gonna be the leaders that are gonna take us forward? Um, making sure that this past was uh, a mixture of us doing all of the right things and regulators doing the wrong things. Um, sorry about the noise, but I think uh, community organizing was an important part of it. And uh, the failure of regulators uh, coming to light is what helped push this over the finish line, right? Um, inspections have been done over the phone with CalGEM. And when we went door to door and talked to a lot of the people where these leaks happened, they were oil and gas workers. Uh, and they believed that the gas was, that leaks were real and that the danger was real. So um, connecting those community voices uh, to decision makers is what's important. Um, and I'm happy that our voices were finally heard. Thank, thanks so much. Kobe, I'd like to turn to you uh, in terms of, you know, perhaps the fact that this bill is being attacked with a referendum is a sign of how important it is. Um, but, you know, and I see the senator nodding, uh, you know, we achieved a major victory and you know that because, you know, you're getting some flack coming back at us. Uh, but, you know, what do we need to do to protect this and moving forward in your community? Uh, what are your thoughts about why this succeeded and how we can learn from that in terms of achieving more victories? Yeah, I will say um, one of the main reasons that setbacks prevailed is because we made this something that the administration could not ignore. We made this something that the entire state of California could not ignore. And um, I swear we didn't prep this, but Senator Limon, I've been saying the same thing for the past couple of weeks. Every single time we lost, we got closer to winning more. And that is how we won. The first bill, AB 345, didn't even have a setback distance. All it said was, we need a setback to happen you know, in a year's time, and we have a year to make that distance. Then the second time we ran setbacks, it was just 2,500 feet on new wells. And now 1137 is 3,200 feet, a bigger distance on new wells. And um, there's some provisions in there that would, um, over the next couple of years, take out some of the existing operations that are currently um, poisoning our communities. So um we kept at it we, we made it something that you couldn't ignore um and every single time we lost it was another opportunity for us to call attention to the really the, the issue that this is and the fact that there are almost three million californians who live within the setback zone who are dealing with this um and i i can respond to the fact that you know it's like the fact that they're spending so much money on this is why it's a big deal um, and, and it's really true. When we, when we look at the progress that we're making, it's really important to look at what big oil is opposing. Um, you know, Cesar brought up um, carbon capture and how it presents a real danger to our communities. And it's really interesting to notice that big oil is spending tons of money to oppose setbacks, but they're actually spending a lot of money for carbon capture. And that really should tell us very clearly where we need to stand on these issues and what is worth fighting for and fighting against. Um, and the other reason that um, I think I wanna bring up about why this was different um, is that it took a couple of years, but Vision kept knocking on the doors of these people in power and eventually um, we have them come to us. So, we were able to put community members who are directly affected um, in conversation with these people in power. Um, and it's not just um, people in the legislature, but in CalGEM and in the Newsom administration. Um, and in, in the same way that we had um, Senator Limon and Senator Gonzalez as representatives of impacted communities in the legislature being the voices for this, 
um, we were able to have um, actual community voices face to face with some of these decision makers. Um, and it, it, it really changed um, once we were able to, yeah, have those relationships um, and build a level of trust um, and make it something that they couldn't ignore. So yeah, my two cents. Thank, thank you for your two cents worth a lot more than two cents, in my opinion. So but really appreciate it. And, and you bring up an important point that, I, that I'd like to uh, perhaps do a similar thing. Let's go around and have this conversation uh, because you mentioned carbon capture and you mentioned about the oil industry. And of course, we all understand that big oil uh, has a big uh, interest in maintaining the status quo. And we don't. Uh, we don't believe that the status quo is sustainable uh, for communities or for the planet. So here's a really interesting question, and I'm curious, I'll start with you, Senator, and we'll go around in the same way because I love the way this conversation is happening. We need a meaningful dialogue about what the oil industry's obligation is to clean up the mess they have created. They push for carbon capture technology because they think that that's a sort of a technological solution, but they need to cap and clean up the old wells at their own expense, period. I'm quoting from one of our attendees here. Uh, what are the legis legislative and legal pathways to make that happen? What is the obligation of the industry? And why is carbon capture and storage something that we should be so cautious or uh, indeed uh, opposed to? Uh, Senator, what are your thoughts about the industry and, and carbon capture in particular? Well, th thank you. Uh, I will say this is a big question, right? And I think that, you know, on car huge question. You, there's huge. a lot of pieces to it in terms of liability and past, you know, oil is a wealth and the future of carbon capture. I think it's really important, you know, as we had this conversation for carbon capture, the conversation around carbon capture has been happening for a number of years. Um, and so uh, there are, again, you know, projects around the globe. And you really had a mix of people who were moving this forward and were, you um, uh, very excited, right, about uh, this particular project. And I will say that it's not all folks who came at it from the lens of wanting to help big oil. Like, that's very important to say that the lens was very mixed. Um, however, I think that a lot of us who, again, have a, you know, a, a history with watching these uh, projects, with watching where the investments are or not made, um, for me, the number one piece was, uh, if you know the reason that so many companies have been investing um, in carbon capture it has to do with this enhanced oil recovery project um, and and that element and so I think that it was really important you know for me and for others um, that certainly that was a piece that would not be included um, so you will not see in California that all companies will buy into this um, because the governor signed a law prohibiting enhanced oil recovery that we ran. And, and this law had opposition. I mean, the week that it was going to be heard in the House of Origin, in the Senate, there was a hit piece, right, on me, a video that was going through social media, um, hitting me on this piece, on this particular bill to try to convince folks to get out. I think it's also important to note that um, there was a momentum. I have to be very direct with you. There was a momentum, and I saw that carbon capture was going to happen. And so I think that, um, you know, for these reasons, we came together, uh, Senator Caballero, myself, and had real hard conversations about what that could look like. Um, and so we, you know, part of the negotiation also looked at obligations, legal obligations, um, you know, um, for carbon capture. We've also had these conversations for idle wells. We've increased bonding and funding. And so some of what we've learned from idle um, and abandoned wells, we were able to put into the carbon capture piece. But ultimately, I mean, the state still can't undo federal bankruptcy laws. Like that is, we there that supersedes us. So you have to know that, you know, could there be a situation where for either carbon capture, as it has been the case with oil, they file bankruptcy? I can't undo these federal laws. That is the reality of where they exist. I think it's also very important to note that the feds have gotten ahead of us at the state level. When I talk about momentum, I also mean that the feds, right, the Biden administration has been putting money into carbon capture, uh, carbon capture projects across the country. So we already had some approved for the state of California. All of these elements are part of the thinking that goes in. It is not perfect thinking. It is not thinking um, or a strategy that is always reflective of 
where we could go if we had a blank state slate. But I think the outcome you saw this year is where we believed we could go given what we knew was coming um, and what we saw was happening, whether California approved these projects or not. They were being approved by the federal government. So I, I, I do believe that we shouldn't undermine some of the protections that we did get in because we would not have gotten them in a year ago or two years ago um, if that would have been the conversation. Is there an opportunity to do more? Absolutely. No questions about it, right? Like, could we have gone stronger? Should we have gone stronger? Absolutely. Um, but I do think that where we, the, the finished product, um, was a product that we would not have gotten again if it wasn't, you know, without all of you. I think the fact that like this community said we won't even have a conversation on carbon capture unless no enhanced oil recovery is part of the conversation. Um, and that was what they hated the most, right? Like, I mean, we got a lot of opposition on that. And so uh, that came from the community saying we won't even go there. Um, unless this this is the bare minimum. And so I think that that's important to recognize that those are some of the things we got, but there's more work to do on this. Thank you. I'd like to turn to our other members before I do just maybe make, make an important distinction here. Uh, when we talk about carbon capture, we're talking about large technological solutions, proposed solutions. Uh, what we're not talking about is, is nature-based carbon sequestration, which is a much stronger and we believe more cost effective and more planet friendly way to draw down some of the legacy pollutions. We'll be dealing with that in a different webinar. Does involve the folks uh, in the agricultural communities, great opportunities for them. But I just want to make sure everyone's clear what we are and what we are not talking about. So, so Marisol, I perhaps turn to you in terms of you live right near the Chevron oil refinery. This is absolutely something that I'm sure, what do you, I'm sure you think about all the time in your community, what do you feel is the obligation of the oil industry to your community and to helping fund this transition as we draw down and pull back from fossil fuels? Thank you, Doron. Yes, this conversation has been happening, uh, quite a fierce conversation has been happening. One of our main um, purposes at the refinery is also storage and distribution here. And so one third of our uh, industrial land is covered uh, by Chevron and all of their warehouses, tanks, stacks, as we call them. And for us, carbon capture isn't, although it has been alluded to, right now we are in a fight against the hydrogen plant. We have hydrogen units happening. This is a sort of greenwashing that Chevron has, has always done to our community. And this is their narrative that hydrogen is going to be, and they're looking to convert our refinery into hydrogen. And so there's a lot of education right now and a big fight with a lot of our community-based organizations looking at what does it really mean to have a hydrogen plant proposal, what is that going to mean for green jobs? A lot of people are talking about the economic impact. Um, a third of our uh, tax revenue does come from Chevron for the city of Richmond. And so we are really, as more local community members, talking about different forms of diversifying economy, like Cesar talked about, just transition doesn't really resonate with our community either. Uh, but when we stop, when we really do start talking about workforce development and what carbon might mean, our community hasn't leaned into it. They've definitely leaned and we've done focus groups. I also work for the Safe Return Project, which employs formerly incarcerated individuals. And through those focus groups, a lot of our uh, impacted systems impacted community members would like to see wind turbine solar, we have the bay. So we're being really creative and innovative and making sure that we're not buying into what Kobe was talking about, essentially Chevron's game plan, because we know that that is not the way to go at this point. And so we're continuing to educate and move forward in a way that is what, it's what conducive to actually what our community wants and what our community is envisioning. Thank you so much, Marisol. And, and I'd like to give uh, Cesar and Kobe an opportunity to respond. Uh, carbon capture, uh, oil industry, uh, Cesar, 
Uh, I want to wrap another question into this. It came specifically for you. Uh, do you see a change in the way your community is getting engaged in these issues? Uh, has there been, uh, uh, you know, more interest in pushing back? I mean, is there a shift in the mood in your community? Uh, and if so, why is that? And how might we use that uh, in terms of pushing back against big oil? Yeah, thank you. And I, I think I can answer the question with the question, right? And in, in what motivated my, my neighbors and my community to move it? Why did so many wells get discovered all of a sudden to be leaking? What's causing all of these wells all over the place to leak? And the reality is they have been leaking. Regulators knew that they were leaking, but they were sweeping it under the rug, right? And when community members uh, know about this and they're educated about this, you cannot uneducate the educated, right? Uh, community members go from, it kind of smells like gas sometimes in my neighborhood to I know what's causing that smell. I know what that smell means and I'm pissed about it. So what do I do? Who do I call? Why do I have to call six people to do something about it, right? And enforcement is not reliable. We have like 125 inspectors in California. There's 40,000 wells in Kern County. And what has that led to? Uh, the fact that uh, inspectors were found to be doing their inspections over the phone, right? And when operators receive a tax break after so many past uh, inspections, why wouldn't you say, yeah, it, we're doing fine when you know that there's no mathematical way that an inspector is going to go out there for years, possibly decades. In the, in the result of the Morningstar wells, uh, it went unchecked for over 11 years and was found to have explosive levels of leaks, right? So knowing that there is something dangerous in your backyard uh, gets people going, right? Because it makes it their fight. Uh, we never go into a community and say, hey, this is your problem. You have to help me fix your problem, right? We go into a community. Uh, we ask what worries them, and if we know that what worries them is linked to problems in the environment, then we help them do something about it. Uh, and that's one of the biggest reasons that people have been have been moving around this, right? It's because it's not just, you know, a, a mysterious bandit that's making wells leak all across California. It's faulty regulators and irresponsible uh, policy that has allowed uh, enforcement to be what we depend on. We cannot depend on enforcement. We need realistic protections. And that's what setbacks are. There cannot be a leak in a well that does not exist in a neighborhood that never had it. So that's what that is. That's what it represents. And uh, that's a generational shift in how communities develop and how we, um, you know, face the, the world with, with better health, right? When we have better public health, we spend less money on, on, on medications and we can spend more time outside and we can spend more time with family and we miss less school and we miss less work. Um, so these are all things that at many times are ignored, but the family economy should be at the center of it. And when people understand that, you know, they'll volunteer for years as they have to fight setbacks, uh, like the Committee for a Better Arvin, Committee for a Better Shafter, um, Comité Progreso Lamont, and nameless other volunteer committees that have been fighting for setbacks for decades. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar. And Kobe, I know we're approaching very close to the end of time, but I just wanted to give you a chance to respond from your community and from the perspective of Vision, uh, you know, what, what are some of the things we need to be concerned with uh, in regard to big oil? And you, you mentioned a really well, look at what they're doing and do the opposite. <laughs> like, so how would you summarize that in, in, for your community? Yeah, I would just sum up um, pretty quickly. Uh, what we're seeing right now is <clears throat> an industry that's kind of in its death throes. Um, you know, oil and gas in California has been in decline for a long time. Um, and we hear these myths, right, that oil and gas is, you know, responsible for, you know, employment of, you know, like hundreds of thousands of Californians. But the reality is that when we look at the numbers, not only have they been in decline, we see this kind of like boom and bust cycle where, um, especially like, you know, not counting the, you know, office workers and the marketing people, but thinking of like, the community members, pe people in rural places in California, especially the oil and gas workers themselves, they're hired, they're let go, they're contracted out. Um, these are no longer, you know, the, the good jobs that they once were as well. And this is an industry that's going to try to do anything it can to get the last little bits of oil out of the ground. Um, and so we're working on not only telling the story about why we need setbacks, but telling the story of the corporate greed um, that's really, really driving this. You know, right now what we're seeing is a lot of attention um, after years of the environmental environmental justice community bringing it up um, to the windfall profits that oil and gas um, companies are making. They're, you know, they're price gouging us at the pump and then declaring, you know, 
crazy profits like they've never ever seen before in California. Um, and this is all because they know that um, the time for that transition away from fossil fuels um, is here and it's happening now. And, you know, one big indication of that is just, I think, you know, two days after or a week after the setbacks law passed, um, it was signed into law by Governor Newsom, um, Air Energy, which is one of the big oil and gas projects in California, um, that was a joint venture, um, was sold to um, a European company. It was a venture by Chevron and um, one other org that I can't remember, but maybe Sessad knows. Um, and it was sold. And right. so um, what it's up to us to do is to hold them accountable, um, like Sen Senator Limon was speaking about, and Sessad to make sure that they clean up the mess they made before they just declare bankruptcy and dissolve into nothingness and then the taxpayers are stuck with it. Um, and so that I think is like big picture, maybe what's coming next in the next two years, definitely fighting for setbacks, fighting for that yes vote on the ballot measure in 2024, um, and making sure that we aren't going to fall for their millions of dollars of advertising to, to convince people otherwise. Well, well, thank you so much. And, and we're, we're not quite ready to wrap because before we wrap, uh, I want to give everybody who's on this call an opportunity to take an action uh, related specifically to what we're talking about. And to introduce that in a couple minutes, I'd like to, to bring in my colleague, Mark Victoria. Uh, Mark, why don't you tell people what we can do about it right now? Good morning, everybody. And I am trying to get my screen shared here. And I hope you all can see this. Um, yes. I'm going to go. Oh, I went ahead and put it in the chat, but I guess I lost the chat when I did this. Uh, so, as Senator Limon and pretty much everybody else here had talked about SB 1137, once again, thank you, Senator Limon, for co sponsoring or yeah, co signing this bill and being a uh, co author. We really appreciate that, obviously. Um, so, you know, a lot of conversation has been had said about this. Right, um, industry is fighting against this bill, and that is going to delay uh, the work that uh, all these organizations and others have done. So we're asking folks to take a look at um, our webpage here, and we'll we'll drop this link in the chat. And what we're asking is for the governor to sign an immediate moratorium on any new oil and gas drilling permits in California from now until the the w whatever happens in 2024 we want to make sure that we're, we're not paused by this we want to continue to um i'm so sorry we want to make sure that you know you guys go ahead and, and sign up here please log on uh please click the link come down here sign up uh we're going to be sending these uh letters to governor newsom asking him to declare this moratorium uh, I'm sorry for stumbling here. Uh, my apologies, but we'll go ahead and drop this link in the chat in just a second and uh, hope you guys can uh, sign on here. So, Thanks very much, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, California residents, all residents, everybody, please tell the governor what we think about this. Spread that to your communities. Uh, tell everybody uh, why it's so important to preserve the victory that we achieved uh, with Senator Limon's bill. Uh, just a, a couple months ago. So uh, yes, I see clapping, Cesar is clapping. Uh, I wanna just take this moment uh, to remind you all that this is part of a webinar series by the Climate Center. So please, we hope you will join our future webinars. We also hope you will endorse Climate Safe California. Once again, over 1,700 Californians, elected officials, uh, nonprofit leaders, business leaders, and regular folks uh, have endorsed our policy platform, and we encourage you all to do it. I want to thank everyone who attended. I want to thank you all for being here. I also especially want to thank our panelists, uh, Woody Hastings from our team, Senator Monique Limon uh, from Santa Barbara and Ventura County, Central Coast, beautiful part of the state. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Cesar Aguirre, thank you so much for representing the voice of your community. Uh, Kobe Nasik from Zion, California, and Marisol Cantu from the Richmond Listening Project. We cannot thank you enough, not only for what you did in being with us today, but for the much more important work you do every day uh, in our community to make California a climate safe, thriving, healthy, safe, clean community for ourselves and most importantly for our kids and for our grandkids. Uh, we love this golden state and we want to make sure it stays safe in the future and the work you all are doing is critical in that. So thank you for your solidarity and your partnership. 
And thank you everybody for being here. Uh, once again, uh, please go to the Climate Center's website at theclimatecenter.org for more information about our programs. And I wanna thank you all for being here. Uh, I now declare this webinar over. Uh, Senator, if I had a gavel, I would bang it, but I don't. So I'm just gonna say thank you all very much. And we hope to see you all again sometime very soon. Goodbye.